morning. <clears throat> I don't know who's to blame, but somebody moved their clocks ahead too far to the winter. <clears throat> Who did that? Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Kent. <clears throat> We're glad you're here. It's good to be gathered together again in community. We're a spiritual community that seeks to be diverse and inclusive as we, if you know this, say it with me, as we inspire love, work for justice, and grow together in community. I'm Randy Bish, in case you didn't know, and this morning's uh, worship associate, <clears throat> we just take a moment to breathe and to enter into this time together as community. And we invite spirit to be present, to be present among us and to open our hearts to life and the gift of this day. The Dalai Lama says that when we make a mistake, we need to ask ourselves, can I love this too? Can I love all of me, even the peevish parts, even the insecure parts, and the anxious parts, can I still love me? Because I can love my niece when she sticks her hand in my coffee and yells at me or uh, gets mad at me. That's easy. She's young. I don't expect her to be perfect, but oh, I must be. Can I love my anxiety too? Can I love my depression? Can I love my desire to seem like I have all of my stuff together even when I'm freaking out? Can I love all of me? Can you? Come. Let us consider these things and worship together. the center of me. Please let me feel inner peace from my center at the center of me. Please let me feel inner peace from my center at the center of me. Please let me feel inner peace from my center at the center of me. My heart is
from my center at the center of me As Unitarian Universalists, <clears throat> we light a flame within a chalice to unite us in worship. It reminds us of our ongoing search for the light of truth within us and among us. The chalice is also a light to guide us on our shared journey together and a reminder that we are all interconnected in the great web of existence of which we are all a beloved part. As Bill Wyland lights our shared chalice, I invite those on Zoom, if you have your chalice, to light your home chalice with us. Please join us in the words of our chalice lighting. Love is the spirit of this church, and service its law. This is our great covenant. <clears throat> the truth in love, and to help one another. As a spiritual community, we take time to acknowledge and share the joys and sorrows, the challenges and celebrations of our lives. And so this morning, as Emily and Vanessa lead us in a song, you're invited to come forward and to place an item in the bowl of water, a small stone, a flower, <coughs> silently acknowledging and giving thanks for this community in which we share our lives. And if you're on Zoom, you're invited to share your joys and sorrows in the chat box, and then a little later I'll read them along with the yellow cards that I've received. So you're invited now in a spirit of meditation, or prayer, or quiet reflection to come forward. With us, a sorrow, she asks us to please lift up Kim, who's taking on the challenge of cancer, a big challenge in life, and we surround her with our care. Marion Yeagler shares a concern. Hal Walker is having a real hard time in his health journey. So we want to surround and, and care for Hal both from a distance and perhaps in joining him in his quiet meditation group that was mentioned in our weekly bulletin. Diane Cardew shares a celebration. Mike starts his 60th birthday turnaround Mike starts his 60th turn around the sun today. Happy birthday. <laughs> Forgive me. In our first service this morning, Kurt Beiling shared a joy of learning to love oneself and the ability to embrace joy. Kurt, something we're all trying to learn. Swanee Benita gives thanks for, the, is happy that the Wolves presentation that was given yesterday was successful. And if you'd like to, to know more about it, see um, Swanee after the service and she'd be happy to talk with you about it. Mm -hmm. And Bryce says, Bryce says, this is my first time watching the service from Zoom. I had a joy this week of attending a martial arts tournament in Michigan and getting to talk to my father on the way there and on the way back. Along with getting to hang out with one of my students while we were waiting and holding to be called for our forms. Sounds like fun, Bryce. Can't say I know much about martial arts, but I'm happy you do. <laughs> oh, and Pete Kirk is, is expressing joy for his new job. Boy, we want a fresh start for you, Kirk, and we wish you all the best as you start this. Wendy Mann shares a concern for a friend who's navigating caring for her newly widowed mom who has dementia. Wendy, we know this is a hard time and we support you as a community and love you through this difficult time. And Heather Pritchard also lets us know that Scott's 61st birthday is today. So we have several birthdays 
to celebrate today. We hold all these things in our hearts and minds. Holding all these, we pray together. We're here with you. One, two. take a moment and I'm um, going to lead you in a little musical practice. Um, I learned this at conference um, from one of my colleagues, uh, Lilena Romero. It's a song that she wrote. And uh, Sandy uh, as well. We'll be doing this together. So so we can all just hum, tune, tune this pitch together. <laughs> mm -hmm. So keep it going. Mm -hmm. So some of you can keep that going, and some of you can also add some other words with this, OK? So it goes, let go. Let go and breathe into the goodness that you are. So let go, and because we need to hear that multiple times, let go, let go and breathe into the goodness that you are. Mm. Let go, let go. Let go and breathe into the goodness that you are. Let go, let go, let go and breathe. to harmonize. Let go, let go, let go, and breathe into the goodness. We're going to keep doing this while Sandy speaks a poem over top of us. Let go. My beloved Let child, go. break your heart no longer. Each Let time you judge go. yourself, you break your own heart. You stop feeding on the love, which is the wellspring the of your vitality. The time has come, your time to live, Let to celebrate, and to see the goodness that you are. You, my child, are divine. You are pure. You are sublimely free. You are gods and goddesses in disguise. And you are always perfectly safe. Do not fight the dark. Just turn on the light. Let go and breathe and into the goodness that you are. Into the goodness that you are. 
Today's reading is entitled Enoughness by Dana Lee Simon. My peony didn't bloom this year. It's a little early for peonies, but stay with me. Let's go into the summer. She came up nice and green and tall too, but there were no buds. Nothing that was going to unfurl into her gorgeous fuchsia flowers, so big and beautiful that they always bend her to the ground. I was sad at first. I found myself giving her extra water and encouraging her in my mind. Come on, come on, baby, bloom. Then a little exasperation set in. Come on, come on. Flowering is the whole point, isn't it? Next, compassion. Yes, compassion for a plant. Honey, it's okay if you don't bloom this year. <laughs> Take a break. I don't think you got enough water last summer, and my guess is there's a lot going on at your root level that I just can't see, but I know you know about it. Finally, love. Shown by long drinks of water beyond what our sprinkling system can give and offered through a simple honoring of her enoughness in all her green beauty. I'm so happy you're here. Two years into my cancer diagnosis, Dana Lee writes, my peony is a powerful metaphor mirroring the places this journey has taken me showing me what I have already lived through, reminding me of my own fallow time that I'm happy to say feels more and more like a memory than a reality. There was the sadness, and sometimes still is, sadness and exasperation about all that cancer took from me, about all the ways that I could no longer show up the way I used to show up, Sadness and exasperation about how my outward appearance has changed, about how tired it made me, and how so many things that I never thought of twice now seem like so much work. Self-compassion was one of the best gifts I gave myself in my journey, offered right on time to allow me to receive the help and the support that I needed helping me to soften and allow for a new normal. I know that my own practices of self-compassion allowed me to find compassion for my peony, and the compassion I found for it has served to renew the self-compassion that I offer myself and as I continue to go through my own summer growing season. Now the love flows to myself, to my peony, and out beyond my own backyard, too, just as it's designed to. My peony didn't bloom again this year, and that's okay. Compassion. Growing up in a religious home, I heard a lot about the importance of compassion for others. The Christian scriptures tell the story after story of Jesus modeling and teaching about compassion. For example, when he was speaking to a crowd of listeners, we read in Luke, who hadn't eaten for some time, we hear that Jesus had compassion for them and instructed his disciples to go out and find them some food. Another time, when Jesus met a mother grieving the death of her only child, we read that he was moved with compassion for her. 
One time he was teaching his listeners to love your neighbor as yourself, and someone asked, but who is my neighbor? And he replied with a story about a man who had been robbed and beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. One after another, good people simply walked on by. But the hero of Jesus' story is the Samaritan, in that day, the enemy, who was moved with compassion, bandaged the stranger up, took him into town, and paid for his care until he recovered. And in a final example, Jesus tells the story of an ungrateful son who demands his inheritance before his father died, basically wishing his father dead. The son then went out and spent his inheritance on parties and prostitutes, and when the money ran out, he finally decided to return home, no doubt in shame. The story continues, but while the ungrateful boy was still far off, the father saw his son and was filled with compassion, and he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Yes, Christian scripture has story after story of Jesus leading by example and teaching his followers to have compassion for others. I'll be honest, it's hard to reconcile the Grand Canyon-sized gulf between the stories told about how Jesus lived and the lessons he taught and what we see and hear today about so many of his supposed followers. Compassion, yes, I learned about that, but what about self-compassion? I, I may have heard again, or maybe I wasn't listening well enough, or hadn't lived long enough to understand the significance of self-compassion. In my work as a therapist at Cleveland Clinic Center for Comprehensive Pain Recovery, we work with folks who live with pain 24-7. Most have tried a lot of different medications, therapies like acupuncture, aqua therapy, steroid injections, nerve blocks, even surgeries, yet still have unrelenting pain. And to add insult to injury, since folks living with chronic pain may look fine, you can't see their pain, they're often not believed. It's implied that they're exaggerating, or maybe drug-seeking, or maybe just making it up. So many patients report that they've been told, it's all in your head. It's hard to overstate the suffering that chronic pain visits upon people. Acute pain is quite simple. It's the result of damage to the body. It's a survival mechanism. If I'm careless and injure myself, this is my body's way of warning me not to do that again. But from the moment I break my arm, for example, I already know that with time, my body will heal the damage and the pain will stop. Acute pain. But for reasons science does not yet understand, with chronic pain, the nervous system itself is the problem. It's malfunctioning and continuously sending pain signals, even if there is no obvious damage that explains why you're having that pain. The nervous system, we might say, is falsely sending pain signals. The pain is real, but the reason for the pain is not necessarily the normal reason of damage. We now know that physical pain, like that from a broken arm, and emotional pain, like anxiety, stress, anger, or depression, are processed together at the same place in the brain. Brain scans, functional MRIs, have shown that the brain treats physical and emotional pain as though they are the same. Pain, physical pain, is intensified by anxiety, frustration, fear, despair, or a great deal of stress. So, it's in this context that I first really heard about the significance of self-compassion. When I judge myself, when my inner voice is harsh and critical, 
science now demonstrates that this actually can intensify my overall pain. So why is it that we so often judge ourselves, criticize or speak harshly to ourselves in ways we would never speak to a good friend? We know how to be kind and compassionate to others, experiencing tough things in life. But when we're experiencing tough things, when I fall short of my own expectations, when I make a mistake, a poor decision, self-judgment happens almost as though on autopilot. Psychologist Kristen Neff has done a lot of research on the significance of self-compassion in our lives, and I invite you to look up Kristen Neff. She's got a website and a good book. Dr. Neff describes self-compassion as a way of relating to ourselves kindly, embracing ourselves as we are, flaws and all. She identifies self-compassion as having three core components. The first one may seem obvious, but it's about treating ourselves as we would a good friend, with encouragement, with kindness, with empathy and understanding. And we learn to be as compassionate to ourselves as we are to others, sometimes easier said than done. The second component she points out about self-compassion is our common humanity. It turns out this business of harsh self-judgment is a fairly common human experience. Almost everyone struggles with accepting ourselves as we are, and if you don't, God bless you. <laughs> I'm happy for you. When we're able to recognize that we're all flawed, that we're all works in progress, then we can open up to the possibility of treating ourselves as we would a good friend. The third component of self-compassion, and perhaps the most important one, is mindfulness. Mindfulness is being with what is. Being aware of our thoughts and our emotions, the good ones, the tough ones, and all. And if our self-criticism is happening on autopilot, then it's pretty hard to do anything about it. So mindfulness is the process of becoming more aware in the here and now of my self-talk, my self-judgment and criticism. And as I become more aware, then I'm, I open up to the possibility of treating myself with the same compassion that I do others around me. And this is why it is so important to be part of a community such as this congregation. Here we learn to know and understand each other and the common joys and challenges that we face in life. Here we can recognize and call out the best in one another and be compassionate and empathic when we are not at our best selves. We can help each other as we aspire to live out the values that this community advocates. We can help one another as we come together around our shared experience, whether we identify as agnostic, Christian, Buddhist, humanist, or whatever other label we might use or whatever combination thereof. Here, as we work together and worship together, participating, for example, in the discussion between the two services, working alongside the youth who serve a monthly community meal for those in need, perhaps volunteering to serve coffee, sitting quietly and meditating with Hal and others in this community whose lives have been deeply altered by health issues or educating ourselves on ways to address the challenges faced by our neighbors who do not have their own homes. In all of these interactions together, in all of these small ways in which we share ourselves and hear the challenges and joys that we each have, in all of these interactions, we hold out the possibility of growing not only in compassion for ourselves, 
not only in compassion for others, but in compassion for ourselves as well. May it be so. We'll pause for a moment of silence. Adrian Rich said, My heart is moved by all that I cannot save. So much has been destroyed, and I have, and I have to cast my lot with those who age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world, starting with ourselves. Each month we support an agency in the community whose work expresses the value that we hold dear in this faith community. And March's special offering is for the Portage Animal Protective League. And if you're writing a check, please note March special offering in the memo line. The morning offering will now be given and gratefully received. I'd like to invite you to sing along on this one too. <laughs>
As our service draws to a close, I invite you to join in the words for extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this chain, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. May we carry these in our hearts and minds until we are together again. Please rise and join in the singing of our closing hymn, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. Would you look at your neighbor with your hand on your heart for just a moment? Someone sitting beside you. And can you repeat after me as you look at them? I am worthy of love. I will love me. I will have compassion on me. Because I, am worthy. because I am worthy. Following the benediction, you're invited to remain seated just for a bit, and Kurt is going to come up and make an announcement and re related to our stewardship campaign. And we're really, really excited about this time of year when we recommit you know, our, our vision, our time, our finances to the work of this community. So as we go from this place in the words of, Ed, of Ida Lashan, when we truly care for ourselves, it becomes possible to care more profoundly about other people. The more alert and sensitive we are to our own needs, the more loving and generous we can be towards others. And so may the long time sun shine upon you. May all love surround you. And may the pure light that is within you guide your way on. Namaste. Oh. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kurt Beiling. Um, I think a lot of you know me. Um, I'm very uh, grateful to be able to stand before you. Um, and yes, I am standing right now. <laughs> Um, so, you know, for the longest time, um, I've been looking for a church. You know, why does one want to go to church? You know, one wants to redeem some sins. I don't know. I want to, you know, find love and happiness. You know, it just I felt compelled that I needed to find a church. And for the longest time, I just couldn't find a church that I could believe in. 
Um, and because church is supposed to be such a holy thing, you know, that I couldn't be blasphemous to myself. I tried. I went to church. I went to several churches. Um, but I really just couldn't find a church that I could believe in. And part of that then, um, I really just didn't have what a church could give me, the companionship, the, you know, just, well, so anyways. I had some problems in my life, you know. Um, I had a cloud of guilt and, you know, just always over my head since, the, you know, the beginning of my memories. Um, and, you know, so I tried different ways to get out from under that cloud. And some of them, you know, a lot of people understand may not be the best ways to do things. And so, uh, fortunately, after 60 some years, I was able to have a transformation, a life changing, you know, transformation. And part of it was because of my association with this church and with the people who belong to this church and the leadership of this church and the volunteers of the church. That was part of it, you know, but the biggest part was and I can't believe that, you know, the theme of today, you know, the beginning you know, uh, session, the middle, you know, round tables and, and this was the, you know, the inner pain, but then, you know, stop the self judgment, care for yourself, love yourself. And I didn't realize until I came into, you know, that there are believers that and um, that there is no judgment day, there is no, you know, hell, you know, that you do have love and joy that is freely given to you, and you can be compassionate, and you can share compassion, and there's others to share compassion with, and joy, and uh, it just changed my life changed and I chose to be happy I chose to be compassionate and almost at the exact same time I stumbled upon a church that I could share this wonderful miracle this thing that was given to me and that church is this one right here and that church was these people right here. Thank you very much. stewardship theme is the song Draw the Circle Wide. We had sung it in choir a few months ago and we all really liked it because it's such a simple statement that's so important about inclusivity and so on and the kids sang it and also learned to sing it in sign language which was pretty fun. So it just struck me this song was seeking us out. The generosity team of the church runs the annual pledge drive, which is the way that we fund our church's annual budget through 
members and friends of the church making pledges to contribute money to our uh, operating budget each year. The pledge drive will run this year from March 3rd to 24th and uh, will be the people who care most about the church making promises to donate money throughout the coming year. Drawing the circle wide means taking care of everybody and that includes our staff. More than half of our staff is paid less than the UA, UUA recommended guidelines for a brand new employee with no experience. So Jennifer and I are increasing our pledge significantly this year and that's the main reason we want to see this happen. We want our congregation to live according to our values, put our money where our values are. My son and I started coming here back in November and we feel so welcomed by everyone and it, part of that is we feel like we can really be who, who we are here and it feels like family already from pretty much from the first day. In, in context of the church, you're seeking a, a broad based community and we as a church get stronger with different visions and different voices and we learn. I mean, we are a community of seekers. I first learned about Universalism when I was studying history back in college and I learned about the Unitarians and the Universalists back in the 18th century. But the beauty of the Universalists is that in a time when everybody else was preaching fire and brimstone, the Universalists had a big tent theology where they said, God loved you no matter what. And so draw the circle wide as a reminder of our universalist theology that whoever you are, you are welcome here. So the Unitarianism is very attractive to me because it's basically embracing that idea that we're all inside of that circle. And I think this morning is interesting because like the message in the first service about environmentalism and it, they're saying like, what if there was no trees? What if there's no atmosphere? In other words, without that stuff, none of us can survive. So we're actually all in this together. To me, it means a more liberal, uh, earth-loving, um, uh, a more science-based way of looking at things, but still a spiritual way of looking, you know, a deep spiritual way of, of um, looking at things. To me, that means to reach out into the community, to people's extended families, to the wider world. It means to get people's opinions um, and to just to make our lives better by getting good ideas from other people and drawing them into good acts. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. intention to be more open than I am. Drawing the circle wide to me means giving up your time, talent, and treasure in support of building a stronger community. Drawing the circle wide to me means being more inclusive and being always open to having more. Drawing the circle wide to me means making room for all voices, all talents, and all people. 
Drawing a circle wide means living out of a spirit of generosity and realizing that we can do more. Drawing the circle wide to me means that we are all connected by love. Drawing a circle wide to me means that everyone's voice is heard and all are welcome. <laughs> Challenge, if we meet our goal plus 10%, I will hula hoop in front of the entire congregation.